Good morning. Good morning. Let's go ahead and open with prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your uh, great kindness to us. We pray that you would grant us an appropriate humility before your word this morning and that you would impress it on our hearts. We ask that we would be uh, shaped in our souls to accord with your word, to walk in your ways, and that we would experience uh, every blessing that you have granted us in Christ. We ask that you would accept our worship this morning and that we would praise you in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we are uh, today on the fear of God and piety and atheism uh, on your handout. I believe uh, it's worded slightly differently. Uh, first, the first commandment, fear of God and impiety, uh, lesson 11. So last time we started talking about uh, the first commandment, and we said at the heart of the first commandment is what we are calling uh, piety. Uh, we understood to be this loyalty to God that involves a not only reverence of him, but uh, an attachment to him deep within our souls, that there is indeed even an emotional component uh, to it. We're going to look, uh, continue to look at that today and then look at its opposite as well. So at the heart of piety, at the heart of a right relationship with God and fulfillment of the first commandment is the fear of God. Uh, this is, of course, where we start. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, as you all know. And so we start here. Now, Pictet defines uh, the fear of God in this way. He, he says that there are actually uh, two definitions. There's a definition in the broad sense, and there's a definition in the narrow sense. The definition in the broad, broad sense is sometimes it means the worship of God in its entirety. So it includes everything that is part of the Christian religion can be summarized as the fear of God. As particular examples of this, he cites a couple of passages, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, where we read, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. So on the one hand here, the fear, fearing the Lord your God appears to be synonymous with keeping all of God's commandments from the heart which, of course, uh, encompasses the entire Christian uh, religion. On the other hand, uh, we could also note that true worship of God in that full expansive sense, all everything in the Christian religion begins with the fear of the Lord. It begins, as we've noted before, uh, with a proper orientation or disposition of the heart. We see the same thing in the psalm, Psalm 3411. The psalmist is going to describe basically what the fullness of uh, Christian religion is, what it means to be right before God and to live rightly before him. And the psalmist says this, Psalm 34, 11, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So what does he mean when he says, I will teach you the fear of the Lord? He's going to teach them everything they need to do to live rightly before God. So it's comprehensive. On the other hand, the fear of the Lord could, in the narrow, strict sense, be focused on the first commandment and our proper heart orientation in that commandment. And so Pictet goes on to say that the fear of God sometimes means the reverence with which we honor the infinite majesty of God and which causes us to lower ourselves before him, to be continually afraid of offending him, and to dare to do nothing against his commands because we fear his wrath and the punishments that accompany it. Now, we can see a little bit of this uh, already even in our shorter catechism. So uh, we talk about what is required in the first, first commandment. The first commandment requires, requires us to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God and our God and to worship and glorify him Accordingly, Well, implicit in that worshiping and glorifying him is, in fact, fearing him. Now, in the larger catechism, I do want to read that out. Um, if you look at our larger catechism on the first commandment, you'll see this expressly stated. So 
Uh, larger Catechism, question 104, what are the duties required in the first commandment? The duties required in the first commandment are the knowing and acknowledging of God to be the only true God and our God, and to worship and glorify him accordingly, which of course is what we find in our shorter catechism. And then it goes on to say, by thinking, meditating, remembering, highly esteeming, honoring, adoring, choosing, loving, desiring, fearing of him, believing him, trusting, hoping, delighting, rejoicing in him, being zealous for him, calling upon him, giving all praise and thanks, and yielding all obedience and submission to him with the whole man, being careful in all things to please him, and sorrowful when in anything he is offended, and walking humbly with him. Now, as we look at Pictet, you'll note that several of the categories that are uh, employed there in the larger catechism, in that particular answer of the larger catechism, are sometimes bundled up with, again, the fear of the Lord or fear of God. So the fear of the Lord, fear of God, uh, is at the heart of keeping the first commandment. It's going to uh, have its tentacles, as it were, into every aspect of obedience to the first commandment. It is that disposition without which you cannot actually fulfill any of those other parts of the first commandment. And so Pictet asks us, uh, what drives us to fear God? Uh, so we have uh, on your handout, we've seen the definition of fear, uh, the fear of God, and then uh, letter B, motives. What is your motive to fear God? And what we note here is that overwhelmingly, the motives to fearing God are drawn from God's character. Of course, it's not exclusive to his character. It also involves, of course, the way in which he acts in the world, the things that he does, his works uh, evoke uh, appropriate reverence and fear of him. But uh, primarily, the fear of God is grounded in God's own character. So, for example, uh, the first motive to fearing God is God's own holiness. We read in Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? So note there, of course, we're talking about the fear of the Lord. It's coordinated with glory. And then he says, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. So notice here, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name for you alone are holy. It's because God is holy. It's because of the holiness of God that we are driven and motivated to fear and glorify him. So we have the holiness of God. Second, and this may seem a little bit counterintuitive, we actually also have God's goodness as a motivation to fear. So uh, Psalm 130 Verse 4, the psalmist talking about forgiveness, uh, starting back in verse 3, the psalmist says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? No one could stand before the Lord if he held our sins against us. But then he says, But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. The motivation or the purpose uh, of God being particularly forgiving to us is he wants us to fear him as a consequence. And so forgiveness of sins does not motivate us to uh, treat God flippantly uh, or to reduce our sense of God's majesty or his holiness. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, it actually encourages us to see him as the holy and majestic God that he is and to revere and fear him uh, accordingly. Now, that also means, of course, as we're going to note in a moment, the particular form of fear in view here is not... Uh, what Pectet and others will call servile fear. Uh, that would be, there would be an incongruity between saying God's kindness and goodness and mercy and his forgiveness, on the one hand, is supposed to drive us to fear him. Well, surely it doesn't drive us to a servile fear that we are constantly simply fearing God's punishments. Certainly, there is an appropriate sense of the fear of God's punishments for wrongdoing. And yet, there's also the, the fear of God uh, or the aspect of the fear of God that brings into view his mercy and his kindness to us so that we actually want to draw near to him precisely because he is a kind God who pardons our sins. So we have the holiness of God. We have the goodness of God. Uh, third, we have the omnipresence and omniscience of God. That is to say, God is everywhere present and he knows all things. That's obviously an appropriate motive to fear God because there's nothing that we can hide from him. We can't uh, take our sins off into some corner of the world and pretend like God will never see and we can hide it away there. That's just not going to happen. Uh, 
all things are open and manifest to him. All things are open in his sight. So we see, for example, perhaps most famously, is the 139th Psalm. And in the 139th Psalm, uh, the central point here is that the psalmist is saying, there's nowhere I can go where I can escape God's presence. Now, for someone who is seeking the Lord's mercy, uh, that is a source of great comfort because there's nowhere you can go to get away from God as a savior. Uh, but on the other hand, for the impenitent, that is a cause of great concern because there's nowhere you can go that you can escape the justice of God. And so the psalmist says in Psalm 139, particularly beginning in verse seven, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. So there is no way to escape the presence and the knowledge of God. Likewise, just a couple of other references here. Uh, in Hebrews, again, the language uh, that I just alluded to uh, previously, you'll find this in chapter 3 of our confession, this kind of language taken from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, where the author says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And then finally, of course, in Romans chapter 2, Paul wants to uh, emphasize that uh, every person will be held accountable for his deeds, and he says, uh, beginning in verse 15 of chapter 2, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. And so we cannot escape the presence of God. This can be a source both of comfort and, uh, appropriately, a warning to us. But you have here, again, think of the characteristics of God, holiness, goodness, omnipresence and omniscience, and next, his justice, along with the corresponding threats from his justice. God is a just God. So Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 45. Jesus here is telling a particular par parable, and in verse 45 of that parable, he says, but if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. And so here you have in this parable the expectation, referring, of course, to uh, the, the return of Christ in judgment, that you have people who have greater or lesser degrees of knowledge, and you have these servants who are uh, therefore faithful to lesser or greater degrees, and their corresponding uh, penalties. And so this is a particular warning then that would flow from God's justice. We see again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. There Peter tells us, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So Peter expressly tells us then that God is one who judges impartially, and because he is an impartial judge, again, as we saw in that previous parable, we have to conduct ourselves in fear through the time of our exile, that is to say, through the time of this earthly sojourn up until uh, the return of Christ. Yes? Where was that parable? Uh, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 45. Um, actually, the parable begins if you were earlier, but that's the section that particularly cites. Um, so again, same idea you have, we're going to be judged, each one according to his deeds, and that is an appropriate motive to fear the Lord. Uh, you again have uh, in the Gospels, Christ in Matthew chapter 10, 10 verse 28, uh, where he, of course, famously says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, 
rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So Christ sets up this dichotomy. We have a choice. We can either fear men who can kill the body, but they can't destroy our souls, or we're going to fear God who can destroy both soul and body. And the very fact that God is a just God who can destroy both soul and body is an appropriate motive, again, to the kind of fear that we're talking about here. And then, of course, finally, and this should be fresh in your memory uh, as we've been going through the book of uh, Hebrews, we have a number of warnings, uh, obviously, in the book of Hebrews. We see them back in particularly chapter 6. We see them again uh, here in Hebrews chapter uh, 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 12. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So because God is a consuming fire, because this is his nature as a just and holy God, therefore the appropriate response is reverence and awe. And those are, of course, roughly synonymous, or they overlap with what uh, we are talking about as the fear of the Lord here. So the holiness of God is a motive, the goodness of God is a motive, his omnipresence and omniscience is a motive, his justice is a motive. Uh, next, his lordship is a motive. The fact that he has authority and majesty over all of his creation. The prophet Malachi, in Malachi chapter 1, uh, verse 6, draws this analogy uh, between uh, fathers and masters on the one hand and the Lord himself on the other. And he says this, a son honors his father. That's a fifth commandment issue, right? This is normal, and it ought to be the case. A son honors his father. That involves what we are talking about here as this appropriate reverence and fear. So a son honors his father. A servant honors his master. Same thing with servant-master relationships. Servants have an appropriate fear and reverence of their masters. And the Lord then says, if then I am a father... Where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. So the analogy again is if we're going to have an appropriate reverence or honor for our fathers, if we're going to, if a servant is going to have an appropriate reverence or honor for a master, how much more then ought we to have a re reverence and fear of the God who is the ultimate father, the God who is the ultimate master? That trumps everything else. And so if it's true in the lesser case, it is also true in the greater. Again, we see the same thing in Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22. The Lord discussing his lordship over creation says, Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as the boundary for the sea a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. So again, the argument is God is sovereign over all of his creation, including the sea, which, uh, as, as you no doubt know, is uh, used particularly as this symbol of chaos. And the Lord is able to bring order out of chaos, and he's sovereign over it. So, well, that is supposed to mean we ought to fear and reverence him. He's the only one holding this whole thing together. He's the only one preventing it from call, uh, falling into complete chaos. And it's precisely because God gives, as it says here, the rain in its season that we ought to fear him. He's sovereign over the weather. That's not something that man ultimately controls. God controls it, and therefore we ought to appropriately fear him. Next, again, still dealing with uh, the Lord's qualities, and this is closely related to his lordship. In fact, his lordship uh, implies this, is his power. So we've seen his omnipresence. We've seen his omniscience. He knows all things. He's everywhere present. He's also omnipotent. Uh, the Lord has, he is the almighty. He has all power. And this, again, uh, elicits appropriately fear of him. Exodus chapter 15, verse 16. We see uh, in the Song of Moses, as the people of Israel uh, are coming out of uh, Egypt, they've been delivered. Chapter 15, verse 16. 
talking about these uh, other tribes and people groups who have heard about the Lord's deliverance of Israel. He says, terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. So the terror and dread, where does it come from? Because of the greatness of your arm, they're again, symbol of God's omnipotence, his almighty power. And perhaps most famously, Job, obviously you're going to see this all over Job. Job uh, chapter 37, verses 22 and following. Job is going to emphasize the power of the Lord. He says, out of the north comes gold and splendor. God is clothed with awesome majesty. The almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power. Justice and abundant righteousness he will not violate. Therefore, men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. It is precisely because the Lord is great in power. It's precisely because he's the Almighty. It's precisely because he is clothed with awesome majesty that men fear him and that they ought to fear him. But we are not limiting uh, our motivations to fearing God from his character. That's primary, and we ought to keep that centrally in view. So you go back and you, again, read chapter 3 of our Confession of Faith you're going to find an abundance of reasons to have an appropriate fear of God. But we can go on from there and we can see examples of the way God's own character and work bears on the world. So we can actually look at the things that God has done uh, to his, whether it's his enemies in the past or even chastising his own people that become appropriate motives to us to say, well, we ought to be uh, careful then how we walk before the Lord. So Pictet says, Another motivation is examples of divine punishments. And so we have various examples. He cites, for example, uh, the Red Sea event. So you have Pharaoh's armies destroyed in the sea. Uh, you have uh, various instances throughout Israel's wilderness wanderings or their entrance uh, before they get into the land of Canaan, where rebellion, for example, you think of Korah's rebellion, is dealt with very severely, and that is an appropriate reason to fear the Lord. Or again, Paul says, Romans chapter 10, verse 21. The Lord's statement concerning Israel, but of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And so within the context, of course, of Paul's argument here, a rebellious Israel, apostate Israel has been cut off because they have perpetually rejected the Lord. And then, of course, there's an appropriate warning then to Gentile nations as well. Don't be like that, because if you do, the same thing's going to happen. Uh, you don't want to become apostate. Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 7. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And so even as we've been covering the book of Revelation, we've seen uh, that you have examples throughout the history of the church. You have them in the first century, and you will have them all the way up until the return of Christ, uh, where God actually delivers judgment in this world on rebellious people, particularly those who persecute his church. That ought to cause them to pause and consider what they're doing. And finally, uh, the ultimate form of this divine punishment is final judgment itself. And we actually uh, saw a little bit of that, if I remember correctly, yesterday. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 and following. There the Apostle Paul uh, is talking, of course, about walking by faith and not by sight. And then he says in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And then he says this, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. So the connection then is, we know that God is going to judge us for the deeds that we have done in the body. There is a future judgment. Therefore, that's, that's what it means to know the fear of the Lord in part, is that we know that there is an impending coming judgment where we will be held account to account for the deeds we have done in the body. Every word, every thought, every deed. Now, before we look at uh, the divisions of kinds of fear, uh, any questions 
on those motives? Any comments on those motives? Yes, sir. I'd add regarding the motive from God's goodness, it should give us a great terror, a true terror at bending the God to us. Hmm. I think this is a motive that should be even deeper than a fear of hell and punishment to a Christian. How could we sin against the God who saved us? Yeah, um, that, and that gets actually to the, the point of the division uh, that picked up, and of course is common throughout the tradition, of different kinds of fear is uh, one of those divisions is filial fear versus servile fear. Uh, there is a world of difference between fearing God in a servile way where you are merely afraid of his punishments, but you don't actually love him. Uh, you don't actually see him as good. You don't actually see him as the God whose reputation and honor you want to protect and preserve in this world. Uh, there's a world of difference between that on the one hand, and on the other hand, a filial fear, the fear of a son who loves his father and who respects his father, uh, who looks at his father as a kind and good and generous, and he's afraid to offend his father's honor because he knows how good his father has been to him. And that's the difference in view here, is that what we're striving for, what we're looking at, is uh, filial fear, the fear of children. Uh, indeed, we see, of course, in Hebrews chapter 12, we've, uh, Eric previously uh, preached on this, uh, where we have the Lord chastising and disciplining his children. It's legitimate children who are punished by their father. Their father loves them, and therefore he disciplines them. And so we ought to have this kind of fear that says, I don't want to dishonor my father, and I also don't want the consequent punishments that come from it. It's not either or, it's both and. And so the, the, the child who disobeys his father and dishonors his father, of course, doesn't like the punishment, but also doesn't like the fact that he uh, hurt his father's reputation or honor. Another division in fear of the Lord is uh, what the distinction that picked up next here is that which happens before the sin and that which happens after the sin. Now, there's a sense in which both of those are appropriate, but we would prefer to have the former. Uh, have the fear before you actually commit the sin instead of committing the sin and then having the fear afterwards. Uh, and so he says, one kind precedes sin and is the bridle by which a man is restrained from falling into sin. So uh, he again cites from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, so while you still have the opportunity to get right with God uh, in some way, shape, or form, let us fear, lest any of you should ha seem to have failed to reach it. So fear on the front end and get right with God. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Paul warning the Corinthians there. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. So there's an appropriate fear that says, I've seen what's happened to other people. He cites Old Testament examples there of Israel engaging in rebellion. And consequently, they receive uh, God's punishment. And Paul is saying, you see those examples, learn from them. Don't do that thing so that you can avoid the same kinds of outcomes. Fear before it ever happens so that you don't fall. But there's the other side of it, which, of course, is the fear that comes after and the fear of condemnation in light of uh, our uh, sins that we've already committed. And this is why John says, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love. Now, he clearly can't be talking about the kind of fear that we want to achieve because he's saying this particular fear that he has in view and love are mutually exclusive. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear, the kind of fear that John's talking about, has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So there is a kind of fear that, again, is something that comes after the fact, and it is only awaiting impending judgment. And that's not something that we want to characterize, of course, uh, the believer's heart, that he is living in fear of ultimate or final judgment, but that the love of God cast out that fear and indeed replaces it with appropriate fear, the filial fear for which we are striving. Um, he goes on to say, Pictet does list uh, several items that sometimes uh, he says that theologians will 
uh, include an entire body of different types of fear besides the ones that we just looked at. So he'll say things like, uh, theologians divide fear into reverence, horror at sin, humility, caution, and adherence to God. These are basically subsets, types, or indeed ingredients in the fear of the Lord. You'll see the same types of categories, uh, very similar categories, in our larger catechism on the first commandment. So uh, again, these things overlap. All of which, you'll note, come from the heart. First commandment obedience, and consequently every other form of obedience, stems from a heart that fears the Lord. Any questions or comments on those different types or categories? So next, we have uh, the indications, signs of fearing God. So how do you know uh, if you actually are fearing God? How do you know if you've actually uh, succeeded in fulfilling this particular requirement that this virtue has been cultivated in your soul? Uh, any, any comments? Does anybody have any suggestions as to what the signs of fearing God might be? Anything else? All right. Well, that actually is the first one that Pictet mentions. Uh, the first mark of actually fearing God is hating sin. Uh, so the first thing that's going to happen with the person who truly fears God is he's going to have a hatred for sin. So he cites a number of the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, where he says this, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. So in Proverbs, uh, these are almost interchangeable. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. That's what it fundamentally means. Again, he says uh, in 3.7, uh, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Those are the opposites. Those are the choices, right? So you're either going to be involved with evil or you're going to fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, by definition, that means turning away uh, from evil. Uh, the second mark of fearing God that Pictet notes is what we've previously talked about when we were talking about conscience, and that is abstaining from things that you don't know whether they're lawful or not. Because remember, if you have a conscience that tells you that, well, something you're doing may be or is a sin, whether that thing objectively is a sin or not, you're committing a sin by participating in it. You're violating your conscience. And so if we fear God, we want to err on the side of safety, and we want to err on the side of, well, I know this isn't wrong. I know God is not going to be disappointed with this. Whereas this other thing, he, I either believe that God would be angry at me for that, or I don't know, and it's possible that he might. Um, and so whenever we have the option to choose between those two paths, we want to choose the safer one that we know that this is what God desires of us. The next few uh, items here in signs of, of the fear of the Lord, uh, the next couple are again connected to internal heart life. And that is to say uh, zeal. If we have the fear of the Lord, we're going to have an appropriate zeal. You'll recall when I drew up on the board the triangle uh, where you have this normative standard is the law of God and the situational standard, what we're striving for in obedience is the glory of God. Uh, Pictet says one of the marks of fearing God internally is having an appropriate zeal for both of those things, that you appropriately have a zeal for God's law and you appropriately have a zeal for God's glory or to please God. So he says, um, First, he says, a passionate zeal for good works. Uh, he cites here, again, Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Paul writes, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So fear of God then produces in us a zeal to be holy, a zeal to live according to uh, to God's word. Uh, Pictet doesn't cite uh, Titus chapter 2, but that's another passage that immediately uh, comes to mind where Paul tells us that 
Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So again, this appropriate fear of God flowing from forgiveness and redemption should then motivate us to be zealous for uh, good works. Not only should we be zealous for good works, we should also be particularly zealous for God himself, to please God and to glorify him. Here Paul cites Ephesians, or excuse me, picked that cites Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6, where he tells servants here to serve their masters not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. So the chief end there then is not, am I pleasing this person or that person or the other person? Am I pleasing the Lord? That is the, the ultimate standard. We see the same thing, of course, in uh, um, uh, earlier when we were looking at, at some of the other passages that you don't fear men, you fear God. Fear Those two are mutually exclusive, right? If you're fearing the Lord, uh, you're uh, not fearing man. A couple of others along those lines, Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, very similarly, uh, again, talking to servants, uh, Paul tells them, Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 4. Paul says, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. And you'll see the same language elsewhere also uh, in Galatians, where Paul is very clear that he's not preaching a gospel that he received from men, and he's not preaching it to please men. He is preaching it to please the God who called him. And that, of course, applies not only to Paul's case, but in the, indeed to every vocation in every area of life. The ultimate goal is to please the Lord uh, in it. The opposite of this, Pictet says, obviously, is if we're striving to do what pleases God, then we're also striving to avoid what displeases God. Uh, and so, of course, that seems to be uh, obvious, and he has some passages there, which I will uh, pass over for now. He then moves to language. So, of course, uh, this fear of God includes our actions, but it also includes our words. And we see that uh, even uh, uh, in the first commandment, larger catechism, uh, this way that we think about God is, of course, going to <coughs> spill over the way we talk about God. That if we, if we have a reverence for him, we're going to speak accordingly. And so we ought never to speak of God in a way uh, that violates his honor. That will, again, come up as well uh, in the third commandment, for example, when we get there. So we don't want to think or act or speak in a way that is out of accord with our uh, fear of or reverence for God. And then the final one that he notes, which is really interesting, is it doesn't say anything particularly about uh, the, the final sign of fearing God. It doesn't say anything particularly about what we're thinking about God or what we're uh, doing, at least in a direct sense, uh, with relation to God, what we're saying about God. That The final mark that he notes is steadfastness in afflictions. Steadfastness, steadfastness in affliction. So for Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26, we read this, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. So if a man has a strong confidence in the Lord, that is the fear of the Lord. Is If he is able to persevere through afflictions, uh, that is a sign that he fears the Lord above everything else. All of the things in the world seem to be going wrong. Uh, the psalmist, for example, is surrounded uh, by enemies. You think Psalm 3, and he's facing all of these problems. And all of those problems are pale in comparison to his commitment to the Lord. You, you know, Ben was telling us uh, yesterday about uh, keeping eternal things in view. Right? That, that becomes the priority. We keep eternal things in view. We keep spiritual things in view. And by that fear of the Lord, we have a strong confidence that allows us to persevere and, and have steadfastness uh, in afflictions. Now, particularly here, we've seen in 
both Pictet, we've seen repeatedly in Scripture, particularly that uh, passage in Matthew chapter 10, where we fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We don't fear the one who can just destroy the body. We don't fear men. We see this dichotomy uh, set up. And of course, it, it draws to mind, uh, you know, Arl Dabney in his sketch of Stonewall Jackson talking about Jackson's fate. And he points out that uh, he had that fear of God such that he did not fear anything else. It's the fear of God that drives out the fear of anything else because that's the only thing that matters. Uh, not what anybody else thinks, not what the culture thinks, not whatever else is going on. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what God thinks. And that's the way uh, Jackson thought about the world. This is why he has those great lines where he says things like, um, a duty uh, is ours, results are God's. It doesn't matter what's going to happen. My duty is to God, and as long as I do that, I'm fine, because he's the only one I fear. Or Jackson elsewhere says, uh, because of his trust in God's providence, he says, I feel as safe in battle as I do in my own bed. It doesn't matter that the bullets are whistling around you and that there's chaos on the battlefield, because I trust the Lord. I'm going to go at my appointed time, and in the meantime, my only requirement is, is my conscience clear before God. So as far as marks uh, or signs of, uh, so far, uh, these signs of fear of God, are there any questions, any comments? I regularly try to pause at moments that don't continue on without someone being able to ask appropriate questions. Okay, there's nothing. All right, so the next is, you'll see there on your handout, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, verse 13. And this, I think, is central for this particular virtue of fearing God. It's also central for uh, thinking about the entire summary of the law, because this is behind everything else in the Ten Commandments. We have in Ecclesiastes 12, what is there referred to, this is the whole duty of man. So the whole duty of man can be summarized in what way? I'm sure people are familiar with, with this. So fear God, fear God and, keep and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man can be summarized as fearing God and keeping his commandments. That, of course, I think is an excellent passage to keep memorized in your back pocket because, of course, it does cover a multitude of cases, indeed, pretty much every case. Um, and in expositing this particular verse for us, Pictet says uh, it means two things. It means two things. He says, first, a man who does not fear God should not expect uh, any happiness. So uh, he actually uh, points out that the language there is uh, literally the whole of man. Uh, duty is uh, presumably supplied there. Um, so the whole of man. So it's man's entire identity. It's man's integrity, if you will, his happiness that is bound up in the fear of the Lord. You can't be happy in the true sense. You can't find your fulfillment unless you are fearing God and not man. And second, he says man should apply himself singularly to fearing God and keeping his commandments. This should be his chief business. Again, that's his whole duty. You can summarize his fear of God and keep his commandments. Now, he wants to highlight here in this exposition, why is it that you have fear of God tied to keeping God, God's commandments? Well, we've already hinted at this before. Uh, one of the chief marks of fearing God is avoiding evil, hating sin. But he goes on to say that why does it tie these two things together? Well, one, because the true fear of God is characterized by obedience to his commandments, which we already saw. And second, obedience to his commandments should proceed from the fear of God. So if we fear God, it's going to lead us to keep his commandments. If we're keeping his commandments, that is a clear sign that we are fearing uh, God. The fear that belongs to evil men does not make them better and is joined with distrust and despair. The fear of evil men, that is to say the fear that unbelievers have, the servile fear, whether of God or whether of other men, that kind of fear leads to despair. Uh, that kind of fear leads to hopelessness, and it isn't as, uh, again, here, it's not the whole of man. It doesn't make them whole. It doesn't bring them joy and happiness. Uh, this is the kind of fear that puts everything in its proper place. I have an ultimate purpose. I have a God to whom I'm accountable. 
and therefore I can trust that everything's going to be okay as long as I do my duty. Um, now the means to this end, uh, this is fairly brief. Uh, what are the means to fearing God? Well, he says we must meditate on the virtues of God, which should seem obvious. Indeed, that's what we just did when we were looking at the motives to uh, fear of God. So if you meditate on all of those virtues and you think about the holiness of God, the goodness of God, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his justice, and so on, if you meditate on those particular virtues and you're reading through your Bible and you see God presented this way and characterized this way, over time, that, Lord willing, by the application of the word, to the, uh, by his spirit to your hearts, you start to think this way about the world. This is who God is. But he goes on to say, not only do we meditate on God's virtues, but we meditate on his blessings, his judgments, his promises, and the great fruits that result from fearing him. So we can actually look at, particularly, uh, though not exclusively in biblical history, we can also look at the history of the church, and see the many ways in which God has blessed his saints who feared him. And we can see the way in which he has punished those who didn't fear him, but attempted to throw off his yoke and rebel against him. And then finally, we will, uh, we will close with the opposites of fearing God. The, opposite in de the opposites and defect of fearing God are the absence of the fear of God. That seems obvious, right? So someone just doesn't care what God thinks. They have no concern for a future judgment. Uh, that's a foolish way to live. Uh, it is, uh, leads to all kinds of wicked behavior because people don't think they're accountable. Um, he doesn't cite it here, but, but this, is actually, this is sort of... Um, you'll see this repeated all throughout in various psalms where the wicked, they, uh, Psalm 10 particularly is what comes to mind for me, uh, is that these wicked people, uh, they, have, they don't have God in their thoughts. Uh, psalm 10, Luther described as being the psalm that basically described the fundamental character of the wicked man. If you want a brief description of the wicked man, you go to the 10th Psalm and you will see there, he's the kind of person that just doesn't think I'm ever gonna be held to account for any of this. It's not going to matter. I live this life, God doesn't care. I'm gonna get what I want out of it and that's it. Uh, so you have absence of the fear of God provoking God and we can uh, uh, consider, for example, Israel's behavior in the wilderness where through their grumbling against God, they provoked him uh, to wrath. And so that's not fearing God. Grumbling against God, again, same, same thing. Carnal security. Carnal security is the opposite of the fear of God. It's again, you think that God is not a God who is just. God is God, not a God who chastises or judges. Uh, he's going to accept me whatever I do. It doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want and I'll be fine. Well, you're not appropriately fearing God for who he is. You're not treating him. You're treating him as, um, you know, you've heard the perhaps the language not so popular now, but a few years ago of, uh, you know, bro Jesus, right? Um, or homeboy Jesus, right? That Jesus is a friend uh, and he's just merely almost a, a, an equal and he'll, he'll never judge you. He'll never hold anything against you. And that's not the Christ of Scripture. That's not the Christ who sits on the throne. And finally, the opposite of fearing God is irreverence toward God's word. We could add there irreverence toward everything else by which God makes himself known as the third commandment teaches us. Uh, but particularly irreverence toward the word of God is a failure appropriately to fear God for who he is. Yes, question or comment? That's the point that's hammered home, especially in the evangelical church, that God is love, Jesus is love, There's no, yeah, there's no sense of... They believe um, themselves to be altruistic in general, but man and mankind is generally altruistic, not selfish. That's right. And so there's, yeah. They fall far and hard. It, it does, yeah. It's so destructive. And, and so you, you, it's completely far into anything, you, which is for, was one of the points there is why regular reading of Scripture is so crucial. Because if you're honest with yourself and you sit down and you regularly are reading through your Bible in a way that isn't just selective, you cannot come away thinking of God as that sort of God. 
who just never has that kind of judgment, that kind of wrath, right? That guy, exactly. You're, you're not going to find that in, in, in the Word. And this is tied together with what you were mentioning earlier with the love of God and forgiveness. The love of God, if it's reduced to that, it is, it is watering it down. It's completely watering down the love of God. It's a God who simply kind of shrugs his shoulders at sin and says, well, you know, that's what you want to do and that's okay and whatever. Not the God who says, that's a violation of my holy honor. And to deal with it, I'm going to send my own son to die a brutal death bearing the sins of his people. Right? That kind of love is a much deeper and more profound love that then ought to be then registered and reflected in appropriate fear of God. Hence, again, the psalmist language in Psalm 130. There's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Not there's forgiveness with you so we can act like you never really cared about sin in the first place. It doesn't really matter. That's exactly right. So <clears throat> irreverence um, for, for God and his word. The opposite in excess. So uh, as we go through this, you'll, you'll keep seeing this over and over again. This is the way typically the scholastics would think about virtues is there's a virtue and there are errors on one side or the other. You can go into the left ditch or the right ditch. You can go into the error of defect or excess. And so there are various errors that he just noted in defect. There is also an error uh, in, in excess. So what happens if you have an excessive fear of God that's unbounded or unconstrained by the scriptures? Okay. What kind of fear of God is that? Well, he says it's superstition. You become a superstitious person if you have this unconstrained fear of God that is in excess, it doesn't have appropriate limits. It's not limited by what the Bible teaches about God's character and actions. You become the kind of person who is superstitious and you think that, well, if I don't do this thing right, uh, I'll, I'll incur the wrath of God. If I, you know, what is it, walk under a ladder, have a black cat cross the street or whatever it is, all of these are, if I'm profoundly superstitious and I think that whatever, all the stuff that happens, I'm going to incur the wrath of God when Scripture simply nowhere teaches that. Uh, that is itself also a sin, and it's a violation of an appropriate fear of God. Uh, and then uh, very briefly, finally, what is impiety? So we've been talking about piety. At the heart of piety is the fear of God, and the opposite of piety is impiety. And it's, he says it is a vice that causes us to worship God without reverence and to give him no worship, or at least not worship that is proper, Many men are impious. So he gives uh, various examples of what impiety looks like. He says atheists, man who doesn't believe in God, obviously doesn't fear him. Those who deny providence, again, they may say, well, there is a God, but he is not in control of things here. Think about, for example, a deist. Those who maintain that the soul is mortal, they care for nothing else except eating, drinking, and so on. So if a man says, well, I'm not going to actually come be held to account for the deeds done in the body after death. All that matters is now. Uh, well, that man can't appropriately fear the Lord either. Uh, blasphemers who live as though there is no God and who laugh at religion. So similar to the atheist, uh, con atheist conception, although the distinction he's making here is this person uh, is someone who may believe or grant the possibility of God's existence. He just doesn't care and he thinks religion's stupid. And so he laughs at it and he goes on down the road and he's going to live how he wants to live and he's going to leave that to the afterlife, uh, you know, if, if there is a God. Um, all of those things are obviously incompatible with uh, the appropriate piety of knowing and acknowledging God to be the only true God and our God and to worship and glorify him accordingly. All right, we'll leave it there. Any questions or comments to close? Yes, ma'am. There are, and, and that's, a, that's an important note. So, um, and you can see this even in our larger catechism with the sins in each commandment that are required and forbidden. Uh, so if you look at uh, any of those, you're going to note that not all of them are equal. Even the least sin, as our own catechism tells us, is sufficient to damn a person to hell apart from Christ. But not, not all transgressions of the law are equally heinous. Right? Some sins in themselves and by reason of several aggrava aggravations are more heinous in the sight of God than others. And so when you look at that list, the, the lesson is not to say that all um, acts, violations of piety, uh, all of these acts are uh, equally severe or equally grave. They are all equally sins. 
but you will find degrees and those degrees are manifested even among believers. So it's one thing for a man to be an atheist and say, I don't believe in God or a, or a blasphemer and say, I'm just going to go. It's another thing for a, a Christian to not worship God with a heart that is full of sincere reverence and fear on a Sunday. Uh, there is never going to be a point in this life where our worship is perfectly pure. It's always going to be tainted. And that itself would be a violation of this command. Um, so it's already it's always lurking there, um, but the idea, is, of course, is again to acknowledge it as sin, and part of the sanctification process is hopefully over time we have increased reverence and fear of God, and not a reduced reverence and fear of God. Um, anything else there? All right, well, let's go ahead and close with prayer. You know, Father, we do ask that you would accept our worship for Christ's sake and not our own. We acknowledge, Lord, that our hearts are impure and that we are not permitted to enter your presence on our own merits or for our own sakes. We ask, Lord, that you would accept our worship in spirit and in truth. We also pray, Lord, that by your spirit we would be uh, sanctified and that we would mature in our faith, that we would grow in greater fear and reverence for you in such a way that we do not grow in dread or despair or distrust, but rather that we grow in love for you, and that we rejoice in what you have accomplished, that we would fear you in such a way that we are confident that you are a triumphant God, and that therefore we do not need to fear anything else. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us with uh, your wisdom and by your word. In Christ's name I pray, amen.